Hello everyone, welcome to our webinar today. My name is Matt Young and I'm part of the technical sales team here at Scaleflux. Normally, I'm out in the field helping our customers, but today I'm happy to be hosting this webinar from my home base. Our topic for the day is understanding how to effectively test computational storage devices with a particular focus on compression. We're gonna take a deep dive into selecting the right benchmarks, configuring the workload, and how to avoid common mistakes. We have a demo plan towards the end to illustrate one of the points we've discussed. So without further ado, let's get started. In today's computational storage landscape, there are two primary categories of testing drives, compression and embedded functions. Compression is about optimizing three main elements, capacity, endurance, and latency of workloads. Now the performance of that could be around bandwidth or IOPS focused. For embedded functions, it's a little more complex. There are a number of embedded functions that can be implemented on computational storage devices. One example is database filtering, which typically looks at scan offload and the like. When using this sort of function on computational storage devices, it helps minimize the impact of scans and other operations, thereby freeing up bandwidth for other tasks. It's crucial to understand that these benefits aren't easily evaluated just by looking at a data sheet. You need to delve deeper, not only into application level testing, but likely using sample production data. If this sounds complex, it can be, often requiring a partnership between the drive company and the end user. That said, future standards in MVME, our SNEA, and host software will facilitate the implementation and therefore the performance comparisons of embedded functions and make it a lot easier to understand. For compression, however, it's a lot more straightforward. We can use tools that we're already familiar with, often just adding a simple command line option to give us the compression ratio we're looking for. Computational storage is a powerful technology that can accelerate traditional block, file, or object-based storage I.O. And it can accelerate applications like SQL, NoSQL databases, stream data, and other software-defined storage. Evaluating computational storage-enabled SSDs requires an understanding of the storage I.O. acceleration they implement, such as transparent compression. For this, we can use traditional storage benchmarking tools, such as FIO, provided they're set up correctly. Conversely, for evaluating computational storage enabled SSDs that implement application acceleration like data filtering, we have to rely on standard benchmarking tools for the given application. This could be tools such as HammerDB or ACT from Aerospike. But this only takes us so far. Ideally, we should be using real world sample data from production. At the end of the day, the selection of a computational storage enabled SD should be based on its demonstrated performance under company actual workloads with indicative data sets. After all, it's all about how the SSD performs in the environment where it will be deployed. Performance metrics are the heart of any evaluation. The specific metrics you focus on can vary based on whether you evaluate the underlying storage performance or an application specific acceleration. For storage I.O., you would typically look at throughput, IOPS, and latency. When it comes to application, it's more about transactions per second or time to complete a task. It's essential, though, to establish a baseline. What is the performance without computational storage? Once you have this baseline, you can measure the improvements contributed by computational storage and identify if there are any trade-off in other important metrics. Don't forget that some elements of a system may see additional benefit that you may not be monitoring at a storage level. This could be DRAM usage, CPU load, or other important subsystems. So remember to check all of the components that lead to the overall system performance and work given. Benchmarking tool selection should ideally follow the standard practice for your lab. If you switch tools to measure the impact of computational storage, it can make it challenging to compare benchmarking results accurately. Your focus should be on configuring the tool in the right way to evaluate the computational storage function. Occasionally, you might need to add functionality to a tool. For example, to evaluate transparent compression, your benchmarking tool must be able of generating data with varying entropy levels. Thankfully, this is an option in most popular IO benchmarking tools. 
For example, in FIO, the option Buffer Compress Percentage allows you to define the exact compressibility level that you want to see in your test data so you can match it to your production environment. Knowing how to assess is one thing, but knowing what to look for will depend on the computational storage function. Data filtering, for example, is a standard computational storage function that applies predicate conditions to determine whether a row of data or specific columns in that row should be returned to the host. The benefit of filtering is to reduce network congestion and reduce host resource utilization. In such an application, large scan operations will benefit the most from this sort of function as they move the most data between storage and the host. However, we should ensure that there are no adverse impacts on other workloads, such as point queries that do not benefit from the computational function. Similar considerations apply for storage I.O. when looking at transparent compression. We need to have that baseline with incompressible data and then add the compressibility to the data that matches our production environment and measure the impact. Good benchmarking is rooted in a solid understanding of what to measure, establishing a reliable baseline and maintaining consistency throughout the host testing process. However, mistakes can occur, often because the tool or the workload hasn't been configured correctly to evaluate the target computational function. In the case of transparent compression, for example, ensuring the data compressibility is set appropriately is critical. With FIO, you need to match the buffer compressed percentage to the compression ratio seen in production target data. Similarly, when evaluating a mixed workload in FIO, relying solely on the RW mix re parameter could be misleading as it enforces a fixed relationship of write IOPS to read IOPS. This parameter overlooks one of the significant benefits of transparent compression, performing significantly more read IOPS given the same host write throughput. To avoid this pitfall, consider separating reads and writes into their own jobs, then gradually increase the write workload whilst observing the response to the read workload. The difference is often dramatic. Okay, that's enough slides. Let's move over to our demo. We've covered a lot of theory, but as they say, seeing is believing. So let's look at this demo to illustrate one of the points we've discussed. So we're logged into our Linux box here in the lab and we've got two NVMe devices. The first one is NVMe1, um, which you can see up on the screen. You can see the file command we're gonna use and the particular bit that we care about is this buffer percentage zero. NVMe1 is a well-known industry enterprise um, NVMe drive. And then we're gonna use NVMe6, which is the scale flux device. So let's execute this command. It will run for a few seconds and we're seeing that we're doing a larger block size. So we're hitting about four gigabytes a second. And you can see that just here. Um, and then we're going to let that finish. And then, you know, as I said, roughly about four gigs a second on that device. So now let's run against node six with uh, no compression on. And you see we peak a little bit higher, but in the same neck of the woods. And then again, you can see, you know, around four gigs a second, maybe 4.5 in this particular sense. So let's go back to our other device. This time we're going to put some compression ratio on. Buffer percentage uh, about 54 is about two to one. There, thereabouts. Now, remember, this is a standard uh, legacy NVMe drive. So this doesn't have any computational capability or anything else built into it. So it really doesn't make any difference whether you give it compressible data or not. It's still going to be around this very respectable four gigasecond performance boundary. Now, let's finally run the uh, scale flux device with a buffer, same buffer co compressed percentage. And you can already see that it's quite a big difference. And on this one, we're seeing about 6.5 gigasecond. 
So even a small amount of compressibility makes a big difference, not just to bandwidth in this case, uh, but also to the case of IOPS as well. Right, thanks very much. As we wrap up, I'd like to emphasize the importance of having a thorough understanding of testing drives, particularly when it comes to evaluating and implementing computational storage. Remember to maintain consistency in your benchmarks, configure your workload correctly, and be mindful of the common mistakes that can affect your results. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we will look forward to continuing to support you in your journey with computational storage. If you would like to go deeper into how Scale Flats can help you with your critical workloads, then please reach out and we can schedule some time to discuss. For now, let's open up the webinar to questions. Okay, morning folks. Just looking at some of the questions we're coming in. Got the first ones beginning to pop through on my feed now. Excuse me while I read the question and look away. So looks like the first one's popping up. Are there online reviews that I can look at to incorporate your philosophy? Um, we've got a few out there from independent uh, sites. There's a particularly good one that, uh, or one that we like that just came out from Tweaktown. Worth read. I think we can pop a QR code up to see that right now. Um, there's also others out there from Storage Review and others. So uh, yeah, Google is your friend on that one and uh, you can find out other online sources where we go into that benchmarking. There's some others popping up. So yeah, more in-depth material. So there's, there's a lot been written about benchmarking across a number of different places, but you'll also find on scaleflux.com, we have a series of blogs that are short uh, reviews of various subjects. And again, I think we've got a QR code that we can link to the blogs. There you go. Um, there's one on testing drives. There's some ones that I've written on use cases. Um, my colleague, Tim, uh, just wrote one up on um, sustainability and how that applies as well. Uh, example data sets, right? The best data set is one that's from your own environment. Uh, that said, I think we've got a link to um, a great website that my colleague JB, who did the previous episode, put up, which was data sets for data scientists. Um, it's a great link on there, various different uh, data sets that you control through and uh, see what one applies for you. But realistically, use the one that's from your own environment um, is always the best uh, case to really get an indication of either how compressible your data is or various states, et cetera, et cetera. What should we be thinking about if I want to compare testing results to cost? So cost is always um, a great one. One of the easiest ways to think about the amount of work you get done in a given amount of rack space, it could be one or two U, et cetera, et cetera. You could overlay that with how much power, cooling, um, the efficiency of your server, so how much work you're getting done, transactions per second and the like. The other thing to think about, um, especially if you're using commercial software, is how much that software is costing from a, a core processor level. Um, if you're using the likes of SQL Server, Oracle, or other commercial software where you're being charged by the core, that can obviously that can often have um, a greater cost than the, particularly the hardware you're looking at. So you're always looking on that return and investment as a complete holistic approach. How do I decide if the performance differences between devices are meaningful? Benchmarking can be deceiving. You know, um, benchmarking's got a lot better. I've been doing uh, participating in benchmarking probably for the last 20 odd years. Um, and certainly there are benchmarks out there which shall we say stretch the truth. Um, always look for the definition of the benchmark. You know, most good benchmarks uh, will actually explain what they did. Um, certainly from our stuff in Scale Flux, we're always happy if it's a fire string to share exactly uh, the, the set of commands that was used, like the compression ratio, but, you know, IO depth, number of jobs, all that good stuff. If you're looking at application benchmarks, then you really want to see, you know, how many jobs are running, uh, whether the server under test had a separate injector or whether it was combined onto the same platform. Um, and really, then you've got to tie that back to real world. 
So what I'd also say is benchmarks are a good starting point, but what you really want to be looking at is how can you replicate the performance workload in your environment as opposed to just relying on pure synthetic benchmarks. <laughs> yeah, cutting through the noise can be tricky. Uh, this is kind of related to the question we just had before is the best benchmark is the one that closely resembles your environment. Um, you know, we see a lot of, shall we say, hero numbers, and those, those are good. They help to give you a, a level of performance from one device against another. But just take a, a really common example. What is the maximum number of 4K blocks writes that I can do on a device? Well, that's similar to a lot of I.O. that does get thrown at a device, but it's not the same. If you take something like a, a log environment and say SQL Server in particular, um, SQL Server can write in various block sizes. It might be as small as 4K, but also it can be as large as 60K. So depending on what your SQL Server is doing and what's going on in your environment or your given app, that I.O. size that you see on a, on a white paper or in a data sheet may or may not match what you see in your actual environment. So it's a good idea to use whatever system tools for the node.